Let's open up our Bibles this morning to the book of Philippians. And we'll notice here what uh, some important uh, uh, teaching the Bible gives us here. We'll begin reading Philippians chapter 2. We'll begin reading in verse 12. Of course, this is the Apostle Paul writing to the church there at Philippi, and he says, Therefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who works in you both to will and to do for His good pleasure. Do all things without complaining and disputing, that you may become blameless and harmless, children of God without fault in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation among whom you shine as lights in the world holding fast the word of life, so that I may rejoice in the day of Christ, that I have not run in vain or labored in vain. <clears throat> yes, and if I am being poured out as a drink offering on the sacrifice in service of your faith, I am glad and rejoice with you all. For this same reason you also be glad and rejoice with me. Friends, it is a wonderful thing to be a Christian. We ought to be in continual praise to God that He has given to us the blessed privilege of hearing the gospel of Christ. And thus we have been able to respond in obedient faith to the saving of our souls. And now we, we are so blessed to bear the blessed name of Christian. Being a Christian is a wonderful thing. Because, folks, that is the one thing in this world that gives our lives meaning and eternal purpose. Through Jesus Christ, our lives are, are not just a pointless series of trials and tribulations that we have to go through in this world for nothing. But in Christ Jesus, we look forward to a glorious eternity in heaven. Of course, we realize that no amount of good works we could ever possibly do could merit for us a place in heaven. None of us could ever do or give or sacrifice enough to put, to put God into our debt. But at the same time, folks, we need to realize that God fully expects His children to be working, productive, fruit-bearing Christians. God has not forgiven us of our sins uh, made us new creations in Christ Jesus so that we just lay down and do nothing. But God expects us that have been given new life to, uh, to show that we're Christians, to work in the things that God has given us to do as Christians. The Bible says in Ephesians 2.10, For we are His workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Did you get that? Did you see what the Bible's direction here to Christians was? It says, ladies and gentlemen, it says that we were created in Christ Jesus for good works. Is that what your Bible says? Which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Ladies and gentlemen, if we are Christians, then we have been given by God certain responsibilities. Responsibilities that each and every one of us must perform and that nobody else can do for us, that we have to do for ourselves. And so I, I want you to know that every Christian is to engage their life first and foremost in being a Christian. Does that make sense? Oh, so that's our first duty. And that's a general broad thing, but our, our first thing is to engage our life in being a Christian. But I'm telling you uh, now that many seem today to desire a, a spoon-fed type of religion. Uh, you, you know what I mean. There are so many people that they come to church without much thought or preparation or real purpose and expect to get their blessing and go home, and that's their version of Christianity. But ladies and gentlemen, we need to understand that God 
intends that you and I should be active in our Christian lives. God expects Christians to be engaged, to be active, busy, and interested. And we show that we belong to Jesus Christ by the things that we do. Titus 2.14 says, Who gave Himself for us, that He might redeem us from every lawless deed and purify for Himself His own special people, zealous for good works. It's talking about Christians there. And it appears obvious enough to me, friends, that those belonging to Jesus Christ are supposed to be people that are zealous for good works. Zealous meaning most eagerly desirous. I mean, that's what we want to do because Jesus has done so much for us. Well, it's certainly true. I'm afraid you don't hear very much coming from the modern day pulpit concerning the need for Christians to be engaged in good works. Somehow this concept has been cast aside in all the noise and glitter of this seeker-friendly movement. But ladies and gentlemen, the Word of God remains unchanged. And the Word of God declares again in Titus 3, verse 8, This is a faithful saying, and these things I want you to affirm constantly, that those who have believed in God should be careful to maintain good works. These things are good and profitable to men. Well, I didn't say it. God said it. But it's my privilege to remind you today that God has said that those who have believed in Him should be careful to maintain good works. And I believe the man was right that said here that the good works here refer not merely to acts of benevolence and charity, but also to everything that's upright and good that we're maintaining an honest and a holy lifestyle. And I want us to notice the Bible also says that we are to maintain good works. That means, folks, it's simple. We understand it. That means it's something we're engaged in all the time. It means that it becomes our lifestyle, our purpose, and our passion. What I'm telling you is this is not a once and done kind of a deal. This is not something that we have accomplished in the past but rather being involved in the good works of a Christian is something that we ought to be doing with increasing passion and with increasing devotion if we are growing and maturing as Christian people. Yes, I'm afraid, and we, you know, preaching about good works is about as old-fashioned a preach as you can get. But surely, folks, we can already appreciate the need for this just from the various passages we've already read here this morning. But I'm telling you, it is silly. It is silly. It is unbiblical. It is ignorance to somehow think that, to think that what we do or don't do doesn't have any bearing on our salvation. For what says the Word of God? Well, we might want to consider James 2, verse 24, where the Bible says, You see then that a man is justified by works and not by faith only. That's what the Bible says. Folks, we're not justified by faith only. Nor are we justified by works only. But we we, we should understand that the Bible is teaching us that both of these are of critical importance. You see, we believe the Word of God, so therefore we do or we obey what God has said. But to to dismiss the works that we must do or the doing of God's will, to to say that it's a non-essential focus to move ourselves to at best to having a dead faith. For the Bible says in James 2.26, For as the body without the Spirit is dead, so faith without works is dead also. Well, I think most of us are smart enough to realize that a dead faith is not going to save anybody. I hope you're that smart. I hope and pray you are. A dead faith is not going to save anybody. But folk, let us say, as the Bible says there in James 2.18, but someone will say, you have faith and I have works. Show me your faith without your works, and I will show you my faith by my works. Ladies and gentlemen, that's what God wants us to do. 
It's to show our faith by our works. But you see, it's impossible to show that you even have faith aside from the things that you do. But you know, as I thought about this, it occurred to me that anybody that really and truly loves the Lord Jesus Christ and loves the Word of God is not going to balk or deny the necessity to be engaged in, in the works of a Christian. A Christian is supposed to live like a Christian. And sure, I realize that there are many out there today peddling this popular brand of, of do-nothing religion that appeals to a certain individual that's really not interested in being a Christian, but is just looking for some fire insurance. But folks, if our thinking is right, we should realize that nothing could be more blessed or beneficial to our lives and the lives of those around us than for us to be engaged in the work of God and the doing the things that a Christian is supposed to be doing. You know, in this world, we can work our fingers to the bone and have nothing to show for it in the end but bony fingers. But folks laying up working for God, that's laying up treasures in heaven. And Jesus encouraged us to do that in Matthew chapter 6 when He said, Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys and thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is there, your heart will be also. That's why the Lord also said in John six twenty seven. Do not labor for the food which perishes, but for the food which endures to everlasting life. Do you think Jesus meant what He said? Do you think Jesus knew what He was talking about? Folks, He said, Do not labor for the food which perishes, but for the food which endures to everlasting life. I think that's really sound advice. So folks, let us give ourselves to seeking the bread of life. Let us labor for that which is going to bless us now and bless us for all eternity. Let us work toward that which has eternal meaning and purpose instead of wasting our lives in a pointless labor over things that don't matter for one bit in the final analysis of our lives. Surely we saw from our opening text that God makes it very clear that Christians ought to be thoughtful and working in our spiritual lives. Let me remind you what, what it said there in that passage. He says, Therefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. Well, Paul's not teaching here that, that we can somehow work and earn our salvation. That's not what he's talking about. But ladies and gentlemen, this does show that God fully expects us to put forth our sincere efforts toward doing His blessed will, which leads us to salvation. Take a second now to think about what God says here. God says, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. Friends, I believe at a minimum, God is telling us right here that we have to be serious that we better be concerned with doing the will of God, of ordering our lives to be pleasing unto Him. Fear and trembling says to me that we're mindful, of, uh, we're exceedingly careful as we can be of displeasing God when we, have, when we show a lack of real effort in our spiritual lives. Ladies and gentlemen, do-nothing Christianity is a sham. Do-nothing Christianity is a farce. Do-nothing Christianity is self-deception because God expects Christians to be doing the works of a Christian. Did you get that? I said God expects Christians to be doing the works of a Christian. Is that not what we've been reading from the Bible this morning? You know, by one account, as I was doing this study, I found that this word works is found 108 times just in the New Testament. You see, God calls us to an active faith. 
And today I want us to see some specifics about how should we, we should be working for God. And folks, as we go through this, I want you to remember that we're working for a purpose. We're working toward a glorious, eternal purpose. We're working for something that's going to count forever and ever. And the day's going to soon come when we'll know just how valuable it is. <clears throat> the promise is given in 1 Corinthians fifteen fifty-eight, saying, Therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast and movable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. So how ought we to be working for the Lord? Well, ladies and gentlemen, our text here this morning is first of all teaching us that we work for God. We must work for God reverently. We must work reverently. You see, our text spoke there about fear and trembling. It, what it was talking about there is about us having a proper reverence for God. You might recall how the psalmist said in Psalms 89 verse 7, God is greatly to be feared in the assembly of the saints, and to be held in reverence by all those around him. Oh, I am thoroughly convinced that perhaps the biggest, the biggest failure in modern day Christianity has been the failure to teach the necessity of fearing God. I'm convinced that a great measure of the unconcern and disobedience we see even among supposed Christians can be laid squarely on the fact that people have no fear of God. They have no fear of displeasing God. They take God in a flippant manner. There's no question in my mind that if people actually believe if they really understood what the Bible teaches concerning God's holy and righteous and just nature, that people will be taking God a lot more seriously. People have no fear of God. Much of the modern day preaching we know has turned God into a passive pushover that merely winks at sin and disobedience and unconcern. But ladies and gentlemen, I'm here to tell you this morning that it is a huge mistake to not take God seriously and to reverence Him as we ought to. The Hebrew writer reminds us in Hebrews 12, 28, Therefore, since we are receiving a kingdom which cannot be shaken, let us have grace by which we may serve God acceptably with reverence and godly fear. For our God is a consuming God. The only way that God can be worshipped acceptably is with reverence and godly fear. But it's been my experience that most people want a comfortable, convenient, manageable God a God that they can call on in times of need, but then mostly ignore when it comes to day-to-day -day living. But ladies and gentlemen, those precious few that are real Christians are going to be working for God in a reverent way, consistently and lovingly. You know, it's not enough to do something for God unless we do it with a God-pleasing attitude. And folks, that attitude in all of our service to God has to be one of loving reverence. It brings me to my next thought. A Christian is supposed to be doing things in the service of God, and another way we must do so, friends, is with a willing heart. If we're going to do anything for God, we have to have a willing heart. Look, well, if we have to be hounded and begged and mollycoddled and put on a guilt trip before we are willing to do something in the service of the Lord, then we might as well forget it anyway. What we do for the Lord has to be motivated by our love and devotion for Him. Or else the word is completely unacceptable to God and it's all to no good purpose. We must have a willing heart. The Bible says, now this verse is specifically talking about our giving, but it teaches a principle here. Second Corinthians eight twelve says, For if there is first a willing mind... It is accepted according to what one has and not according to what one does not have. You see, folks, this is a principle. What it's telling us that we must first have a willing mind before anything that we do or give or anything to the Lord will be acceptable. It has to be done with a willing heart, willing mind. 
we, we need to understand that if God wanted us to control us like a bunch of robots, He could have made us that way. He could have made us easily that way, but friends, God wanted a people that would choose to love and honor Him for His own blessed sake. Because we understand what God has done for us and how how He's a great and wonderful God that is fully worthy of all of our love and honor and worship and adoration and service that we could ever give. God deserves our willing service. And if our thinking is anywhere near right, friends, we ought to realize what a tremendous honor it is that God would give us the privilege that we could do anything that would be found pleasing in His sight, any service that we could give. We're reminded in Revelation 4.11, You are worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power, for You created all things, and by Your will they exist and were created. Brethren, it's, it's also imperative to bear in mind that if, if, our true, if our desire is to do something for God, and and we have to do so with the, with the intention of bringing glory and honor to Him. We want to promote His name in this world. We want to bring Him glory. What I'm trying to tell you is, it's not about bringing honor and glory to ourselves. I tell you, if people were less concerned about getting what they think is their proper credit, there'd be a whole lot that actually more that actually gets done for the Lord. If people were less concerned about having things done their way or according to their good ideas or to suit them, I'm telling you, there'd be a whole lot more gets done. But I'm afraid that far too many are more about tooting their own horn than they're really concerned about doing something worthwhile for the church. But what did our text say today? Well, I would point you to verses 14 and 15. For the Bible says, Do all things without complaining and disputing, that you may become blameless and harmless, children of God without fault, in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation. Very few things can cause more damage to the Lord's church than for its members to be complaining and disputing with one another. But how often is this the very thing we see? Well, we know better. And I think we all need to resolve to do better. Let's honor God with a loving and willing heart, remembering that it's not about us, but it's about Jesus, for He is our all in all. It's a great blessing that we should be allowed to be involved in the work of the Lord. And surely we realize that God doesn't need our feeble efforts. But he, he gives us this privilege in order to bless our lives, in order to give us fulfill, fulfillment, that He gives us this sweet opportunity to be involved in the work of eternity. It's for our good. But another way in which we need to be working for the Lord is steadfastly. We need to be working for the Lord steadfastly. You see, God is looking for the kind of efforts that are consistent and that are dependable. There is, of course, this is, of course, opposed to the hit and miss variety that we see so often, with the emphasis here being on the miss, I'm afraid. Some propose to do all kinds of great things for God, but then somehow or another never seem to do much of anything. But ladies and gentlemen, the backbone, the backbone of the kingdom of God in this world today are those whose efforts are steady, consistent, and dependable. That's the backbone of the church today. Those whose efforts are steady, consistent, and dependable. The Bible says in Colossians 1, 21-23, And you who were once alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works, yet now He is reconciled in the body of His flesh through death, to present you holy and blameless and above reproach in His sight. Now notice verses 23. If, here's the qualifier, He's going to do this, if indeed you continue in the faith, grounded in steadfast, and not 
and are not moved away from the hope of the gospel which you heard, which was preached for every creature under heaven, of which I, Paul, became a minister. I sure wish more Christians were steadfast and dependable, as opposed to flighty and undependable. I sure wish more Christians were faithful and active, as opposed to unfaithful and absent. Folks, the Bible shows us right here in this passage, right in the passage we just read, if it is our desire to be presented to God by Christ as holy and blameless and above reproach, there's a prerequisite gift. There's something we must do. The Bible says, if, if indeed you continue in the faith, grounded and steadfast and not moved away from the hope of the gospel. <coughs> Reminds me of a story I heard one time about a preacher that ran into somebody that had been absent from the church for several months and he hadn't been able to contact them, but he ran into them and said, Well, I, I sure am sorry that you've quit the church. Now, wait a minute, preacher, I haven't quit the church. The preacher scratched his head and said, Help me to understand then, how would it be any different if you were to quit the church? What what would be different in the, in the things you're doing? Then we must beware that hit and miss Christianity is a recipe for complete and ultimate failure. If we are not giving ourselves a steadfast uh, commitment in an effort to grow and mature our faith, then we're setting ourselves up to fall for a lie and to be and to fall away from the truth. Again, writing to the Colossians, Paul writes in Colossians 2, verses 6 through 8, as you, as you have therefore received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in Him, rooted and built up in Him and established in the faith, as you've been taught and abounding in it with thanksgiving. Beware lest anyone cheat you through the philosophy and empty deceit according to the tradition of men, according to the basic principles of the world, and not according to Christ. I'm afraid that many people today are being robbed and cheated listening to the philosophies of men rather than believing what the Bible plainly says. There's a lot of people out there getting professional help when it comes to ignoring the truth and are falling away from the faith. But ladies and gentlemen, God is looking for people who hunger and thirst for righteousness. You remember Jesus talked about the own Sermon on the Mount. He said, they shall be filled. Folks, he's looking for those who really want to follow the truth and be Christians rather than those who are just seeking conscience save by having some form of religion. God is looking for the people whose kind of efforts are sincere, consistent, steadfast, and dependable. Does that describe you today? Is that a good description of your work for the Lord? Is it consistent? Is it steadfast? Is it dependable? That's what God needs. Very briefly, I want to mention one more thing from our text about how we ought to be working for God. Let's notice verses 17 and 18. Here Paul says, Yes, and if I'm being poured out as a drink offering on the sacrifice and service of your faith, I am glad and rejoice with you all. For this same reason, you also be glad and rejoice with me. Well, I think what we need to learn from this is that we should all determine that we're going to work for God. We're going to work cheerfully. We're going to work gladly, cheerfully. You know, this is a concept that, you know, is closely related to working willingly. But folks, when we go about our efforts with a... With a, with a glad and, and joyful heart. It is going to bless God. It is going to bless the people around us. And it's going to be a blessing to ourselves. I mean, we've all seen people. <laughs> Let's not be honest. We've all seen people that were supposedly doing something for God. But by their demeanor, they look more like they're working for the devil. Like it was just this sour, this a sour thing they were having to do. Look, that's no good. That's no way to work for God. 
If we would do anything for God, let us do it in a God-pleasing manner. Let us do it with a cheerful and glad heart. You know, as part of our service every week, we repeat the Psalms 118, verse 24, where it says, This is the day the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. You see, that's a choice we make. We will rejoice because we understand that God has made it and He's given us life. We will rejoice and be glad in it. So why don't we just say that every day that we live and really mean it as we give our service, our best efforts to the service of God. Let us remember, folk, in love and dedication and rejoice as we serve the Lord for what all He's done for us, the hope that He's given us. Where would we be if not for Jesus Christ and the sacrifice that He willingly gave when we didn't deserve it? One of these days we're going to enter that glad place of eternal rejoicing and happiness. And I think it's only right for Christian people to be serving God with this same attitude today. Happiness, cheerfulness, rejoicing. Folks, in His loving kindness and His great wisdom, God has given to us work to do. It's for our purpose. It is for our good. You see, if our thinking is right, we understand that God has given us because He loves us. He wants us to have fulfilled and meaningful lives, lives that count for something. And so He's given us this great blessing, and we need to understand it that way. So let us choose to spend our time and our energy in the things that actually matter. And let's put God first in our lives. Remember, the time is going to come that we're going to be judged by the things that we've done. The Bible says in uh, 2 Corinthians 5.10, For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that each one may receive the things done in the body according to what he's done, whether good or bad. Ladies and gentlemen, let's let's have our things that we do to be honorable and pleasing to God. We'll be glad we did on the day day of judgment. Okay, it's a wonderful thing to be a Christian. If you're not a Christian today, you can become one by believing in Jesus Christ, repenting of your sins and confessing your belief before the brethren. Then you can be baptized into Christ for the remission of the sins and the gift of the Holy Spirit. The opportunities before us today. God gives us a chance for each one to choose, but it's up to us to decide. Let's sing our invitation song today.